As we begin, I would invite you to silence your cell phones and put those on vibrate. They're not already done so. On behalf of the family, I thank you all for coming today as we gather to honor the life of Sue Griffin Price. Thank you for being here as we grieve her death this day, as we give thanks for her 88 years spent with us, as we worship our God for the victory that she has overcome in eternity. We are especially thankful to those of you who have surrounded Suzanne Marshall and the rest of the family over these last few days. Those of you who have covered them in prayer, which Sue would greatly appreciate, and I know that they appreciate your presence more than you will ever know. As we gather, may this time be a time of reflection, of grieving, of hoping, and of finding comfort as we remember this great moment. Would you pray with me? God who walks with us, today we come together to remember this woman who loves you and us so very well. We are thankful for her faith that has encouraged us through stories, prayers, and presence. We are thankful for the ways that she sought to always encourage each and every one of us. In these moments of reflection ahead, help us to feel that encouragement yet again as we mourn her loss Celebrate the resurrection she has now experienced in your presence. Where there is sorrow, give us memories, as we remember one who gave us so many. And as we remember, we pray together in the way that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand and join me in reading our call to worship together. These words from the 23rd Psalm. I will read the fine print. You will read the whole. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I invite you to remain standing and join together in singing our hymn number 422, Amazing Grace.
Boyce Hamilton and Ruby Morgan. She graduated from Central High School in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1954, where she was a member of the Student Council and, of course, the Bible Club. On the front of your program, you'll find Sue's senior photo that was taken at Central and included in the yearbook. Sue went on to attend both Mars Hill and Queens Colleges, graduating in 1956 with a degree in education. She taught in public schools for 38 years, working mostly with elementary age classes and those in need of remedial reading. As you can imagine, Sue Price loved teaching and pouring into the lives of the children with whom she works. It was at Mars Hill that Sue's life would intersect with another student's at a party, I believe, believe it or not, in a relationship that would last decades. We don't know all the details of how Sue and Don's relationship flourished on a campus that didn't even allow students to hold hands, but flourish it did. Don and Sue's relationship was inseparable. She was not just his spouse, but the perfect sidekick to him during his long ministry tenure. Many influential leaders in our world have what's called a body man that serves as their close aide. This person not only makes sure that this leader stays on task, but they also help with the details and even lean to the leader's ear to say, that's so-and-so from so-and-so and such-and-such. And such. But it appears the leader has remembered just about every person that they ever met. Well, Sue was Don's body man. Not only did she help him write sermons and think through sermons and tell him what he didn't need to say, she also reminded him to check on congregants. She went on pastoral care visits with him. And she made sure he didn't forget people's names as he talked to them. Sue was also more than just John's partner in ministry. Many of you know this. She was a servant herself. On Sundays, you could find Sue teaching Sunday school and talking to just about anyone she saw, making sure they knew that they were welcome. So influential was her leadership here at Benson Baptist that the church renamed a Sunday school class the Sue Price class to recognize her spiritual leadership. Yet Sue's spiritual leadership was not only through teaching. She also believed in the importance of relationship and prayer. Very few of us in the room, myself included, had a conversation with Sue that didn't end in some way with her praying for. I reflected on all the times that I have been in Sue's living room where I would, as I often do, ask if I could pray for the person I was visiting, and I quickly learned in my tenure to not say amen, because as soon as I seemed like I was finished, Sue was going to immediately start praying for me, <laughs> and so we would have that time of prayer together. No matter where she went, she wanted you to know that she loved you. She believed in the power of Christ's presence in your life. Even on vacations, I'm told, the family knew when it was time to scatter from the porch when the phone book came out and Sue started dialing people's numbers. <laughs> relationships were important to her, and not even a vacation was going to keep her from fostering those relationships. Tim remembers the time before cell phones when you couldn't even call the Price house because you got a busy signal due to Sue talking on the phone. <laughs> Truly, she was a loyal friend to all who knew her, especially those in the seven churches that she and Don faithfully served with a great love for God's people. Sue and Don had two children, Suzanne and Marshall, whom they loved dearly and were very dedicated to. Though being a pastor's kid is a tough gig, just ask my kids, <laughs> Suzanne and Marshall never felt a lack of attention or love from their parents. Theirs was a close family that loved deeply believed in the power of spending time together. Growing up, you could find them out on the water at White Lake or Holden Beach water skiing. Yes, even Sue, I'm told. Marshall remembers a time when he was trying to teach his mother how to water ski. Quite a feat, I heard, but she didn't quite get it. As the boat surged forward. Sue didn't quite come up out of the water the right way. And even though she was being pulled through the water, they said with a bubble of water over her face, her whole face pulled back as far as it would go, she would not let go of the rope. <laughs> not surprising that they said she never took to water skiing. <laughs> Suzanne's favorite memories of her mother were spent sitting in a beach chair side by side talking about life and faith and always somehow the one who created all of it says that her and her mother spent lots of time on the beach, so much that they were quite the sun goddesses as they sat there. 
Sue loved the water, and I'm told even kept getting out of the boat long into her golden years. The family laughed this week as they remembered the cheap pink visor that Sue would not dare get on a boat without. It didn't cost much. One of the granddaughters said she probably just bought it at the beach place down the road for like three bucks. But it also didn't stay on her head either. They laughed as they recounted the countless times that they would hear Sue exclaim from the boat, Turn the boat around! We need to go get my hat! <laughs> and they did. In addition to being out of the water, Sue also enjoyed playing cards, as some of you know. Tanasta in particular. She enjoyed entertaining. She enjoyed eating ice cream. She enjoyed spending time with her, uh, her group of Methodist friends. She loved telling stories. There were few situations that Sue could not tie a story into from her own life. Our associate pastor, Will Raven, who led us in our call to worship, recalls every time he visited with her, she would remember all of a sudden that he was from the Asheville area. And then she would tell all kinds of stories about the Asheville area, asking if he knew so-and-so and such and such. He really didn't. He's a little younger than most of her stories. But there was always a story to go with a story for Sue. One of the favorite stories to tell around Vincent Baptist comes from the Great Parsonage Fire that took place on December 31st, 1980. The Price family had gone out of town on vacation, as pastors families tend to do after the holiday season. Sue, having felt strange about things, as she often did, decided that she was going to lock up her uh, jewelry and other things in case something happened. Marshall put his guns in the attic space above the upstairs hallway just to be safe. And then, while they were in Asheville, I believe, at the Biltmore, I got a call from one of their neighbors that not only was all the lights in the house on, the house was on fire. Turns out that someone had broken into the house, and upon not finding what they were looking for, it set their front room upstairs on fire. The house might have been a total loss, I'm told, if not for Sue's grandmother's quilts that were in the room where the fire started, one of which is here on the casket today. They kept it somewhat smothered. I'm told that the fire was a defining moment for some of Vincent Baptist for two main reasons I learned yesterday that I didn't know before. One was because Don had received some hams for the holidays and instead of putting them in the refrigerator or somewhere else, he decided he was going to put them in the upstairs bathroom tub. <laughs> so the firefighters, of course, checking every inch of the upstairs to figure out where the fire was, pulled the shower curtain back and saw a bunch of hams in the tub. <laughs> I guess the folks who started the fire weren't looking for hams. <laughs> the second thing I learned was as Tony Barnes made his way up the steep steps to help put out the fire, he hit the deck as the bullets that Marshall had not put above the attic started going off. <laughs> Thankfully, just two walls were shot up and nobody was hurt. The parsonage would survive and has been a respite place for other families to grow as the Price family did, my own included. So I'm thankful for these quilts and the firefighters that have made. Surviving Sue are those that she loved so dearly, including Marshall and Suzanne, daughter-in-law Leanne Price of Princeton, Daughter and son-in-law, Suzanne and Timothy of Raleigh, granddaughter Shannon, Maddie and husband Griffin, Anna and husband Jason, and Macy Price. Great-grandsons, Eston and Eli Brown. Family members, I can't speak for Sue today. I, I can't say everything that she would want me to say because we don't have enough time to do that. <laughs> but I think I can say without a shadow of a doubt that she loved each and every one of you. She enjoyed every moment that y'all spent with her. Even those aggravating ones in the living room, Marshall, that you spent with her in the last one. <laughs> Congregation, I can't speak for Sue. We don't have time. But I think I can say without a shadow of a doubt that Sue loved each and every one of you. She met you for a second or knew you for most of her life. She loved you. And I'm glad that we all got to experience Sue Price's warm love and the time that we spent with her. Because that's just who Sue Price was. A person whose faithlessness and loyalty do no bounds. It is my hope that though we mourn, we are able to celebrate that our lives intersected with hers and that we were, for a brief time, all loved so deeply. Now, while you'll hear a little bit more about her life and faith later in the service, I would be remiss to point out something alluded to already thus far that is critical to know about Sue Price. 
to loved Jesus. And not in a Sunday morning only kind of way where you look at the stained glass windows, maybe listen to some of a sermon and go home, but in a way that everyone knew that she loved Jesus with all that she had. I believe, truly, this great woman of God heard the words of her Savior on Sunday when she arrived in eternity. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And then I'm sure she gave Jesus a big hug. <laughs> As we remember Sue today, it seemed appropriate that Sue's beloved Don be able to play a part in the service. Though he passed in 2016, thanks to technology, we were able to have Reverend Don Price read scripture today. So, hear now these words from Psalm 90 as we continue in worship. Let me read for you Psalm 90. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, and thou didst give birth to the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. You turn men back to dust, and says, Return, children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight are like yesterday, when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. Thou hast swept them away like a flood, they fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. For we have been consumed by thine anger and thy wrath we have been dismayed. Thou hast placed our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy presence. For all our days have declined in thy fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain seventy years, or if due to strength, eighty years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. For soon it is gone, and we fly away. Who understands the power of thine anger, thy fury according to the fear that is due thee? So teach us to number our days, that we may present to thee a heart of wisdom. Do return, Lord, how long will it be? And be sorrow for thy servants, so satisfy us in the morning with thy loving kindness, that we may sing for joy all the days of our lives. Make us glad according to the days thou hast afflicted us, and the years we have seen evil. Let thy work appear to thy servants, and thy majesty to their children, and let the favor of the Lord be upon us, and do confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm the work of our hands. The word of God for us, the people of God.
much she loved him. She was silly and fun and loving and, and caring and godly and everything that we should aspire to be. The world was brighter with, with her and we'll never be the same without her. If you know her, you know Mimi was so full of life and joy. She did this thing where she'd enter a room cheering things like, it's Christmas, it's Christmas! Or singing silly songs like, if I know she wasn't coming, I'd have baked the cake. We have recently learned that she kind of made that song her own. She didn't sing it quite like it was, but Mimi had quite the sweet tooth. Her favorite thing was ice cream. She'd easily forego any meal in lieu of ice cream. When she grew up, she wanted to work in an ice cream shop, although not sure how long she would have lasted because she probably would have eaten a lot more of it than she served. I guess you could say Mimi passed along her sweet tooth to us grandkids too. I remember being at Mimi and Papa's house when I was sick and her giving me a bowl full of raw cookie dough to help make me feel a little better. She must have kept a lot of cookie dough in her fridge at all times for emergencies like these because she always seemed to have it at the best of times. It's no wonder that most of my childhood, if I got sick or if I got in trouble, I'd cry and say, I want my Mimi. Not only did she instill in me a love for cookies and cookie dough, but also a love for reading. From the time I was born until I was able to read on my own, she would read to me. As I got older, she would always make me practice reading. I have vivid memories of pouting while she made me listen to my hooked on phonics tapes. <laughs> while I may have pouted then, I'm so thankful she instilled in me a love for reading at such a young age because it's one of my favorite hobbies now. She joked that her reading to me was, and I quote, the reason I'm so smart. <laughs> I'm not sure of the actual correlation between someone reading to a child and their later intellectual ability, but she made me who I am in so many other ways. I know I speak for all four of us when I say Mimi was instrumental in shaping us into the women that we are today. Although I'm not always good at showing it, she taught us patience while she sat through hours of awful dance routines that Anna, Maddie, Macy, and I would choreograph at the beach without complaining. She taught us joy every time she'd walk into a room singing, even though she didn't necessarily have the best singing voice. Papa used to joke that the Bible doesn't say anything about singing well, but it says to make a joyful noise, and that is certainly what Mimi did. She taught us faithfulness in so many ways, faithfulness to one's husband, faithfulness to others, to the church, and to God. There wasn't a single phone call I had with her, even when she was the one sick and in pain, that she didn't end the call praying for me. I can go on and on, but I'll end on this one. She taught us how to love. Mimi loved hard, that's for sure. She sure did love some ice cream and her dog Molly. She loved a long white sleeve t-shirt, jewelry, and the color yellow. She loved her grandkids, her children, her husband. She loved others, and she loved Jesus so much. You know, never had to question if Mimi loved you. She made it very evident. If you ever got a phone call from her, and boy, did she love that phone, you could feel the love radiating through the call. If someone missed a Sunday at church, she noticed and would call, not to convict you for missing a day, but to make sure that you were okay. Anytime we told her we loved her, her response was always, I love you the mostest. And she's right, she probably did love everyone the mostest. Although it's sad to lose someone who has shaped you and had such a huge impact on your life, it's even sweeter knowing that she's without pain, she's with Papa again, and she's with Jesus. We joke that she probably walked through the pearly gates of heaven yelling, It's heaven! It's heaven! <laughs> On the evening of her passing, right outside the hospital, there was a beautiful sunset and an even more beautiful sight. An ice cream truck parked right by the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect message from Mimi that she's happy and where she's meant to be. We love you the most, it's Mimi. Please tell Papa that we said hey. She loved to entertain and wanted all of us to be on our best behavior when company was around. She knew had the talent to set the most beautiful table, knew how the forks and spoons and everything went very prim and proper. I remember a time when we had company and Miss Sue asked him would he like to bring some ice to the table. 
What do you think Tim Tartan did? He did not use an ice bucket that was left in the kitchen. Instead, he got a cooking pot in the handle and set it in front of Miss Sue. Marshall, Suzanne, and I died laughing, and Tim got that look of that she would give you when you knew you'd done something wrong. She was very disappointed in all of us. Miss Sue was a fabulous storyteller. She loved to talk about her life growing up in Charlotte, how her aunts and uncles loved and cared for her like she was her own. And like Shannon had said, Miss Sue did have many names. She was known as Sue, Mother, Aunt Sue, Pastor's Wife, Teacher, Friend, Card Sharp, Mimi, or Memer, as Don called her, but the most precious name to our family would be Prayer Warrior. One of Miss Sue's legacies was her phone ministry. It was truly a gift from God. She always knew when you needed a phone call and a prayer. Her calls and prayers meant the world to a lot of people, and I'm almost positive that many of you have received a phone call here today to offer support in the good times and the bad times and pray with you. In fact, one of the girls told me about a couple of days before she died, she asked her family to gather around her and she prayed for them. What a prayer warrior. Friendships also meant a lot to Miss Sue. She set an example of how to be a friend to Marshall and Suzanne. Her closest and dearest friend is Aunt Shirley, who lives in Charlotte. Aunt Shirley and Miss, Miss Sue have been friends since grade school. She had another close friend named Billy. There is no telling how many hours she talked and giggled with Aunt Shirley and Billy. Distance didn't matter to her. They were her friends. She was a Christian woman with a heart for God and took the role of a preacher's wife seriously. She was a very important part of Don's ministry. She would help Don in planning funeral arrangements, services, and sometimes sermons. Marshall told me that every Sunday at lunch, she would critique his sermon, realizing she was critiquing herself as well as him. <laughs> Since her retirement, when you saw Sue, you saw Don. She truly enjoyed traveling with him and loved ministering to people with Don. After Don's passing, she's often said that that's one of the things that she missed the most. And she loved her sharing group ladies. She looked forward to every Monday, when she could spend time with her dear friends. She also enjoyed the meals that they shared together. She cherished visits from them as well as others. Marshall and Suzanne, you have shared your parents with your whole life. Being preacher's children, there are time, there's lots of sacrifices as well as rewards. One of the rewards is being the first in line at home comes. <laughs> you both have spent time away from your parents as well as interrupted vacations. And I thank you both for sharing your parents with so many others and with your community. I want to let everybody know that since Miss Sue's passing, there has been a drop in sales in Lance Cracker. <laughs> take a bite and you would shake the crumbs and then you would tap it to make sure you got all of them out. When taking her reclining chair apart, we found orange cracker dust everywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Sue, for being a Christian role model, not only to your children and grandchildren, but to your community. And thank you also for the precious memory. Asked me to sing this. We'll see how it goes. The song is entitled Charity by Kim Gulson. Ooh. 
charity. If love does not flow from me, I am nothing. Jesus, reduce me to love. Jesus, reduce me to love. Love is patient and kind. Love is not envious, not proud, but gentle and meek. Seeks not its own way. Love sings when Jesus prevails. Believes and endures all things. Love hopes and bears every wrong. And love never fails. I have not charity if love does not flow from me. Nothing. Jesus, reduce me to love. One season I was a child. I spoke and I thought as a child. But when I turned to a man, such ways put aside. Though now we see through a glass, yet then we shall see face to face. Though now abide faith and love, the greatest is love. If I have not charity, if love does not She said, hey, we're Don and Sue from Benson. We've been playing cards ever since. <laughs> and over and over, when I would see Don and Sue, it was, hey, Robert, don't you and Denise want to come use our beach house? Don't you? You know you really need to. You can take some time off from serving men at the church. They won't miss you for a couple of days. Come on down to Holden Beach and play some cards with us. We stayed up many a late night laughing and joking. Don and I were partners. Denise and Sue were partners. And all oh, those women could be vicious. <laughs> And Dawn and I won so rarely, we really celebrated when we did. It was a big deal. I'm sorry we, we maybe celebrated too much, but we really didn't win that often. Those girls could play some cards. I want to share with you all that I'm trying to break the bad habit. And I hope you'll help me do it. My bad habit is that when I talk about people who have died, I use the past tense. Well, Sue was. Don was. Scott was. That's a bad habit. Because Jesus said, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. When God created us, he created us eternal beings. When God created us in God's image and breathed into us the breath of life, we are like God. We 
don't die. We may abandon our bodies when our bodies can no longer contain our spirits, but the essence of who we are lives on with God. So if you hear me say, Sue was, slap my hand or my face or someplace, you know, that it'll hurt really well and get my attention because I'm trying to get in the habit of saying Sue is. And Donna is. Because we don't die. It just looks like we do. And of course, what we see with our eyes feels like the truth. It feels like reality. But the truth is we are eternal beings. Aren't you glad? Yes. Aren't you glad? So I don't know that the Bible doesn't say that heaven must have a back porch somewhere. <laughs> you know, I'm looking forward to sitting on that back porch. Never forget one day Sue was talking about her rocking chair on the front porch. Had rotten legs on it. And she couldn't sit in that rocking chair anymore. And I thought that's easily fixed. So I got her another one. She enjoyed it for a little while. As long as she could. When God created us out of love, God created us to connect with God. To be friends. God created us to connect with ourselves. God created us to connect with each other. For indeed we shall spend eternity together. Sue and Don lived that out. Now when I was pastor at Meadow, I knew where to go to get information to find out who was in the hospital. I would go down to Amelia Lee's beauty salon. <laughs> Amelia knew everything. Except when Amelia didn't know something, I had a fallback. I went to the ABC store and asked J.P. Lee what was going on. <laughs> yes, this preacher went in the liquor store in Meadows more than once because J.P. knew it. But if J.P. didn't know it, I called Sue Price. <laughs> Sue Price was backstop to the liquor store guy. <laughs> because she knew everybody, who they were kin to, where they lived, where they went to school. She knew everybody. It was amazing. The most encyclopedic mind I've ever heard tell of. And she loved to tell stories about her friends, about her friends, where they had been, what they had done, what they were up to. She knew all the churches you all had served, and she knew where you were at the moment. She knew if you were traveling. What an encyclopedic mind. I, too, miss her stories. I miss playing cards with her. When you walked in the room, you knew you were welcome. I got to see her a couple of times, last couple of weeks. And she was laying there at times, just hurt and just scared to death, whatever. And I walked in and she'd look up at me and she'd smile. She'd say, hey, I'm so glad you're here. And I knew it because I could feel it. And it was the same when any of you visited her, wasn't it? You walked in the door. She was glad to see you. Glad to see you. And as a pastoral counselor, I work with people who are more religious than others and some who are less religious than others. When I visited Sue, I said the 23rd Psalm. She said it with me. Last couple of times I saw her, I sang in the sweet by and by. You all know that song, There's a Land That Is Fairer Than Day. And by faith we shall see it afar, for the Father went over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. Last Monday, she was having just a really tough day. I started singing that song. She sang with me. Sang with me, and just as we got to the 
chorus, she drifted off in winds. As a Christian, she knew where her hope was. She knew, and she was able to be comforted by God's word and by prayers and by scripture. You all have talked about Sue praying for you. One of my favorite things to do as pastor at Pauline Baptist Church, where I've served since I got sick, 13 and a half years ago. I think I've stayed all this time because of Sue. But anytime Sue was able to come to church, sometimes with Martha's help, anytime Sue was able to come, I'd ask her to pray for us. We'd give her a microphone and she would bow her head and she would pray. And it was just a holy time. Every time she prayed for us. She was so grateful to be able to be here. And grateful for the blessings that she had received. And what a privilege to bless all the rest of us by praying for us. She thought I was a little crazy. Because whenever I do funerals, I like to talk about pirate movies. Who used to think that was weird? <laughs> Can't imagine why. But she appreciated the sentiment because I have noticed that in every good pirate movie is a treasure chest. You ever notice what a treasure chest looks like? They have a round top and they have handles on the side. What do you do with the treasure chest? You bury it. Hmm. Who knew? The only thing is, when you bury a treasure chest, you bury it in a secret place where nobody can go and see it ever again. But when we bury our treasure chests that contain treasure, the remains of people we have cared about, we don't bury them in secret. We put them in fields of treasure chests that will pop open when Christ comes back where we can go and visit the remains of the people we love. They're not there. They're somewhere else. But nonetheless, that's where is some of the treasure they have left behind. My dear Sue, May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, my sister, and has finally given you peace. I bless you, and I bless you, and I bless you. As we continue in worship, we invite you to sing words that mean quite a bit after Dr. Cook's homily. So if you will join us in standing and singing hymn number 447, because he lives, so let's sing. <laughs>
was Mother's Day. We didn't get to see Sue very often here at church because of her health. But that day at our 9 o'clock service, Sue wheeled right in with her family. She celebrated Mother's Day. She went and had lunch. And the next day she was in the hospital from which she would not leave. Sue spent her final Sunday doing two things she loved, worshiping Jesus and spending time with family. And on that day, I preached a sermon, the last of six sermons on the prodigal son, talking about how the father celebrates and calls for celebration. And I think we can all draw hope that Sue is in the presence of that God who loves with open arms, who loved her deeply, and they are throwing a party. So we are thankful that we, though we mourn, can celebrate and share stories, can have a party attitude. Because Sue Price is not here. She has risen. As we prepare to go to conclude this time of worship with a short, short service of internment at Roselawn Cemetery, I invite you to hear these words of benediction. And then you will hear a recessional when they ring those golden bells by the Price family friend Ann Warren, who also played the same in Don's service in 2006. Family, I'll invite you to sit. The rest of you may remain still. Hear these words of benediction. May we rejoice in God's promise of love, joy, and peace. In God's mercy, may we see the darkness of death turned into the dawn of new life, the sorrow of parting into the joy of heaven. Through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died, rose again, and lives forever.
go? Are you fast? Not the little.